Thank you to Jan and Gerhard and Bruce Fetzer and the whole organization for putting these on. These are, these are really great. I think a lot of great things have been coming out of it. Okay, so we will fly into um, some uh, novel ideas about how to approach, uh, assuming, ah, oh, there it goes, how to approach uh, the issues of emergence. So I, I like to start by quoting one of my teachers, uh, Thomas Kuhn, who talks about how you create a scientific revolution um, and that they usually have a, 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 the old scientific system it kind of has an immune system, right? So it kind of protects itself, rightly so, from, from too many uh, premature uh, revolutions. Um, but the way it does is, what, the way it, does is it, it defines what you mean by, for example, a good measurement. So one of the things that um, Yakir and his group has been doing is designing all kinds of new ways of observing the quantum world. And I claim that these other ones, like gentle measurement, and we'll talk a little bit about different approaches, Schrodinger versus Heisenberg approach to quantum mechanics, those deliver uh, very different uh, views on quantum mechanics. So just very quickly, probably you've covered a little bit of this already, um, high-level view of issues of emergence. The, the usual issue is that you know, the things are very constrained from a bottom-up, from reductionistic picture. And one of the things that can happen is you have uh, too many arrows, right? So you have the usual upward causation system. If you were to have something like emergent laws, then uh, this could be, uh, that arrow could violate the causal closure of physics if you believe that this is a, an ontological kind of a arrow as opposed to a effective theory. So sometimes it's called downward causation, top, top down, that kind of thing. So one thing I'd like to emphasize as a general approach to addressing this question is um, to start with the, the axioms of quantum mechanics. Usually we're taught that we start with quantum mechanics, we start with the uncertainty of quantum mechanics, and we derive from that a consistency relation. We see this thing called non-locality and causality, relativity. And those two profound aspects of quantum mechanics just sort of cope with each other, right? But the deep thing we're taught is that it's the uncertainty of quantum mechanics. And then from this kind of approach, we develop all these axioms, and they're not necessarily very intuitive, and so we don't really understand them perhaps very deeply. And uh, Yakir always is fond of saying that's maybe one of the reasons why, A, we don't make so much progress, and B, why we're always shocked when we discover all these new uh, aspects of quantum mechanics. So, uh, so those axioms remind us uh, of this joke. Um, guy goes to a psychiatrist, he says, doctor, my brother's crazy, he thinks he's a chicken. And the doctor says, well, you, you know, go get him some help, take him to the hospital. And the guy says, I would, but I need the eggs. So it's not unlike quantum mechanics, it's crazy, but we need the fruits of the theory, we need, we need the eggs. Mm. So uh, here makes an analogy with this, he says, trying to understand the current uh, status quo axioms of quantum mechanics is like, trying to derive special relativity from the wrong axioms. So if you tried to look at it from these sorts of axioms, it would look very complicated. Um, and so you might ask, by analogy, if we look at relativity, it has such nice axioms, but they're almost contradictory to each other. So we have initial frames of reference, we have the absolute uh, speed of light. And the idea that Yakir had in independently Abner Shimoni uh, was that they, since they almost nearly, those two things almost nearly, re sorry, those almost nearly uh, contradict each other, maybe that's enough to, to give you uh, special relativity. Similarly, they say, if we take, in quantum mechanics, we take non-locality and causality, no signaling, these seem like polar opposites. Maybe those are um, the deeper uh, aspects of quantum mechanics. And so from that, um, Yakir drives uncertainty Instead of taking this approach, right, which has a kind of a picture that nature is capricious, there's no, nothing more you can say than that, that's the deep axiomatic aspect. And we say maybe the deep things are these different aspects of non-locality and relativity, and the idea is can you derive the uncertainty from those deeper axioms? And so one of the things I just want to briefly look at is a couple of examples where you see new aspects of emergence when you start uh, uh, reordering the axioms like this. And so there are many different aspects of non-locality you might want to look at. 
Uh, what's best known, of course, is non-local correlations, EPR. Perhaps less known is the ahorn bohm effect and something that comes out of this uh, called modular variables, which uh, actually obey non-local equations of motion as opposed to non-local kinematics like the, like the EPR. No signaling. Well, we'll just take that uh, in a, perhaps a non-relativistic sense. You, you, um, you don't want to have information uh, going backwards in time, for example. So, you know, famously, this goes back a few 25 years or so, and there's this beautiful paper by Sandra Popescu and Danny Rorlich um, who focused on these two aspects, and they were able to create a, a quantitative way of generalizing what it means to have um, non-local correlations beyond what's in quantum mechanics. So here you see the classical region, here you see what they were able to specify as a no signaling region. Like if you could get a clauser horn schmoney holt inequality greater than this, you could have signaling. And there's the idea is that there was quantum mechanics. And so their idea, they first tried to see that, well, by, by noticing that you had these super quantum correlations, they observed that that wasn't enough as an axiom, namely the causality, that wasn't enough as an axiom to constrain the amount of non-locality that we seem to have. So they asked, what more, uh, what more do you need at the axiomatic level? Make a long story short, this is incredibly, incredibly fruitful area of research. Does anybody know how many papers have been cited and published? I mean, is it a 1,000 or something? It must be extraordinary. Anyway, starting from, that was the beginning of the paper. Starting there, it's been incredibly fruitful. We've learned so much about um, about quantum mechanics from that. So the idea here is can we do this um, in some other ways? So let's, I wanted to take some other aspects other than the non-local correlations. In particular, um, I wanted to consider the idea of non-locality in time and also causality and then, well, we won't have time to get into free will, but that, that gets mixed in there too, just to just, just have fun. So, um, Yakir starts from the realization that we could have two completely identical atoms. The first atom would decay in one minute. The second atom is absolutely identical, decays in one hour. And so there's no difference between them in the beginning, but they behave completely differently later on. Um, and uh, you might ask, well, why is that? I mean, the famous example of this was from Einstein. He said, I can't believe that there's no reason for the difference between them. And when Nikir addressed this question, saying, well, why is it like that? Why is there uncertainty in this way? And instead of taking the approach of nature is capricious, he said that the deep reason for this is it really allows multiple independent boundary conditions at two different moments in time. So for example, the basic theory that you'll be hearing more about that addresses this is what we call the two-state vector or time-symmetric quantum mechanics. And so this here is not a scalar product, it's really you have a pre-selected vector here given at that time t1, and a post-selected there given by that time t2, and then we ask questions in between. So that's sort of the fundamental element in this, um, this picture. So to contrast it with classical physics, in classical physics we may know in principle precisely the initial uh, position momentum in phase space and the final one, and we may know all the interactions, and that's just a deterministic situation. Whereas, if you listen uh, to what Yukira was suggesting, in quantum mechanics, the deep thing here is that we may know everything that can be known about the initial state of something, we may know all the interactions, nevertheless, we may not know the final state. So that can be specified independently of that. It's well known that he then derived uh, the ABL formula to tell you about all the different properties in this intermediate time, given that you know this earlier and given that you know that later. And that's that formula. And um, one thing I just want to, so those are the time evolutions, going from t1 to the intermediate time t, and from intermediate time t to later time t2. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one thing that was very inspiring was to notice that there's a fundamental symmetry here that we could just simply, instead of applying the unitary to this intermediate uh, eigenfunction a sub j, we can take the complex transpose and apply it to the, the phi, which could be interpreted as sending that phi backwards in time. And uh, that's really, that's, that's it. That's the start of, of this uh, reformulation. So, um, so now I'm going to apply this particular reformulation to give you some ideas as to what new, what new things we can learn about emergence. So 
Again, it's a reformulation. That means that you know, it's consistent with everything we've done so far in standard quantum mechanics. So we actually can't tell the difference between is standard quantum mechanics correct or is this correct? This could be correct or the other one could be correct. They, they have, in a sense, identical numerical predictions, but very different uh, interpretations or, or conceptual perspectives. So why do we do this? Whenever we do reformulation, we have you know, several criteria we want to make sure it always meets. First of all, it should be consistent. We already showed that. That's easy. I just, just, it's no more than applying, instead of applying from e to the time t to t2, you just simply applied it to the, the post-selected vector. So that's that. Um, and now the question is, well, what new things about emergence does it tell you um, by addressing this? And maybe I'll get to this a little bit more. Does it affect, does it stimulate discoveries in other fields? If so, then I would say that considering a reformulation of standard quantum mechanics is a useful enterprise. So let's look at that for a second. So um, here's the basic picture, ABL formula. And you probably heard something about um, the weak value. Here's the weak value. Um, I think you've been hearing a little bit about it, but this is a, the basic setup for it, a pre-selection. Spin is pre-selected here in X. You have a weak magnet, right? So that generates a little bit of a, uh, a split that's mostly overlapping. You have another strong magnet corresponding to a post-selection. And then there's your measurement corresponding to the shift that's given then at that earlier time. And Yakir also mentioned yesterday um, a profound point here, that if we look at any expectation value of any observable, we can always break it into uh, a, a sum of weak values times this, this probability of uh, starting with psi and post-selecting in a piece of i. So this means that if that is your distribution for the expectation value, here are two sub-distributions, and they're centered around different weak values. And there's another one that's a different one, different sub-distribution. And so this is a larger weak value, and this is you know, a, a smaller one. This one may be outside the eigenvalue spectrum, um, uh, and you can see a much smaller probability also to see that. Um, and one of the beautiful aspects of this theory, I mean, you, you, one's first gut reaction should be, you know, how, you, you're suggesting the future is relevant to the present? Well, come on. Um, but what the, the immediate uh, uh, beautiful thing is that there's no way of violating causality with this, this kind of a structure. It really comes about as a result of the, of the, the, the structure of what it means to do this weak measurement that has a, sort of the imprint of the, both the pre and the post selection. So what you see here is that even though you get extraordinary um, uh, outcomes for these weak measurements, well outside the eigenvalue spectrum, so here's, a, for example, an eigenvalue spectrum for a big ferro magnet, Here's a weak measurement of, of uh, some component of the spin. And uh, it's way out here at this impossible level. The blue line here is actually the, the tail of the measuring device, which is a condition required in order to even do these weak measurements in the first place. And what you see here, and which is a general feature of all weak measurements, is that the probability to see this result purely as an error of the measuring device, as just noise, is always greater than the probability to see this, this impossible value. Therefore, if I see the impossible value in the present moment, I can't tell you that I'm going to do a particular post-selection in the future. It's completely, uh, it's completely free from that, because it's much more likely that it'll actually be an error. So there's no problem with causality. Um, yeah, so let me skip forward. Um, perhaps some of you have thought about the question of emergence by thinking about EPR and entanglement. Um, this is a beautiful paper by uh, Fred Kranz and one of his students some years back, and they talk about you know what happens when you have you know a higher level of complexity. You have a definite global state and EPR, for example, and um, they analyze very nicely in this paper what happens in terms of uh, uh, hierarchical entanglement and what that says about emergence and other feature other features. Um, I always love uh, some of these quotes by. Abner Shimoni, you might have known he passed away recently. Um, he's actually the second reader on my PhD thesis. Yakir was, was my primary reader. But he looked at the question, this very question of the relationship between EPR and, and entanglement um, and said, well, we need something more. <laughs> this, is, this is not enough, because it's really still uh, it's very weakly emergent, uh, if at all. So I won't read through all this, but you can, you can catch it in the, in the videotape. Um, 
One interesting aspect of the weak value is something called the failure of the product rule. So if we have two observables, even if they commute, we have the sum rule is always obeyed for weak values, but the product rule is, is not. And that has implications for emergence um, because you may see new properties that, that you know, are not a result of properties of individual systems. Hmm. Um, also, in this two-vector pi picture, what we mean by EPR and the non-locality of the EPR actually is a very different perspective. Um, there's different ways of thinking about that aspect of non-locality. But it actually brings out other, I believe, even richer aspects of non-locality. So from this perspective, we can actually think about entanglement situations as being uh, basically local in space, but non-local in time. OK. Um, so I want to give you one example, simple example of uh, emergence in this picture. You probably know uh, the elitzer weidmann um, bomb setup, interaction-free measurement. Um, basically, the upshot is if you have some kind of a um, uh, something that could potentially detect um, whether the, the, a particle went this way, um, then there's a possibility that this other detector may go off. Usually, it's, if that wasn't there, you would always see the C+. Plus. Mm. And from this, you could conclude that the particle, well, was not blocked by this thing because it ended up uh, hitting that detector. And um, you could also detect that there was something in its path. So there's this beautiful example that Lucian Hardy came up with called Hardy's Paradox. We put two of these uh, mock centers uh, next to each other and had them overlap in a certain region. And you could say that this mock center measures this other one and vice versa. Um, and uh, you have a situation, I think, one twelfth of the time when uh, this detector D minus, oh, by the way, you put an electron in here and a positron in there. Um, one twelfth of the time, this detector will go off and that detector will go off. And when that happens, you're immediately thrown into a paradox um, because the only way that could happen is if the positron went through this arm and the electron went through that arm. Um, so uh, if, if that were to happen, the, so the, they both go through the overlapping arms. If that were to happen, it's a paradox because the electron should be in the same region as the positron and they should, uh, they should annihilate. So paradox. What people usually do is, well, they, instead of just talking uh, counterfactually in this way, let's actually do a measurement. Let's see, did the electron take this path? We'll do a measurement right here. And it all worked itself out nicely because as soon as you do that measurement, Shazam, uh, that measurement was so strong, you could have just kicked uh, um, the electron being in this path or vice versa if you did it on the other side. Um, the, the usual measurements are disturbing and therefore you, you, lose the, you lose the entirety of the paradox. So that made everybody happy. Um, um, but what we did is we said, well, uh, what if we apply weak measurements to this situation? And so it turns out that we're able to show that weak measurements allow us to test to a certain extent situations that were normally regarded as counterfactual. So for example, one of the upshots of this uh, setup was we saw something called what we called a uh, weak value of the number of particles was negative, for example, between these out, this outside path and that outside path. And there's a bunch of experiments that were done in this. Um, Ephraim's group did an experiment, and uh, 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 Emoto's uh, lab in Japan did another experiment. There's been some more since then. And also, uh, some, oh, there's been a bunch of nice articles. I just want to thank Michael Brooks, who's out here somewhere. He wrote this beautiful article quite some years ago. Um, so, we have the following situation. We have uh, the weak value of the number of particles in this path is one. It's definitely there. And the weak value of the number of particles in this path is one. It's definitely there. Um, but how can it be that there are zero pairs of particles so that they won't annihilate? And the answer, again, is this, um, um, this violation of the product rule. Um, so it turns out that the product of these weak values is not equal to this weak value times that, that weak value. So you can have zero pairs, even though this particle is there and that particle is definitely there as well. So I'm going to kind of skip through this because I think I'm running low on time. It's a very beautiful analysis that you can make on the whole picture. The other thing I want to point out is that the number of pairs of particles in this outer uh, uh, paths is, is a negative number. So the aspect of emergence that I want to point out, and we kind of 
uh, tentatively call this an atom of emergence, or maybe you could call it an atom of holism, is if you look exactly at this situation, you see that the number of particles in this path is zero, the number of particles in that path is zero, nevertheless, they, you know, they, re they repel each other. It's like minus one pair. So to the extent that um, it's easy to get, you know, EPR is a pretty convoluted argument. To the extent that you get a little bit lost in that, um, well, here's a, what I would call one pure unit of, of emergence, right? <laughs> there's no particle there. There's no particle there. Nevertheless, they, they repel. And this can be completely generalized. Um, it's a very uh, generic, uh, universal aspect of, of matter in general. Suppose we have, this is just one particle, here's another particle. Let's just take five particles, for example. Um, we pre-select, so it's one particle in these, these two boxes. We pre-select it, sigma x equals up. So that means it's in the equal superposition of these two boxes. Like sig sigma is equals one is equal to, is, means the particles in this box. Sigma is equals minus one means particles in that box. And then we later post-select this state. So this is uh, um, sigma x equals down. And then we have um, uh, 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 another component in the z direction. And these are all product states. So we're making a product state of all these um, different uh, particles, all five of these different particles. And uh, this suppose that we now measure in the intermediate time the projection operator onto z of particle one. And um, nothing's there. Suppose we do it now for two particles, particle one and particle two. Still, nothing there. Um, in fact, you will see nothing until you measure all five of these projection operators, the product of all five of these simultaneously. It says, you can see this easily. It's an intuitive proof to see how this works. But the point is that this is also a, a very strong effect. The weak value at this point, suddenly it just goes, you know, boom. The weak value is 2 to the n, or 2 to the, two to the 5 in this, in this, in this case. Um, so again, we have a situation where for one particle, there's, for, if you look at one part of this whole system, Nothing there. Two particles. Nothing there. Three. Any three particles. Nothing there. Four particles. Any four particles. Nothing there. As soon as you hit five, whammo, you get this. You get this huge effect. So that, I think that's a beautiful example of emergence as well. Um, another nice example. Of, probably some of you have seen this. Uh, this cute example called the uh, Cheshire quantum Cheshire cat, and you might um, say that this is uh, analogous to separating a system from its properties, a particle from its properties. So I think this is relevant also to the discussion of emergence, because we'd normally think that a particle is a one whole inseparable thing. Uh, you shouldn't be able to you know, disgorge it of uh, its magnetic field or its spin or so on and so forth. Um, and uh, that's one thing we've been studying a great deal. It's been very exciting. Also, I think Yuji is here somewhere. Um, Yuji's group did a wonderful experiment uh, in the, with neutrons. Um, and uh, we're able to confirm that with the neutron, we, we had a situation where the neutron, the cat, took this upper path in a, this neutron interferometer, but there was no spin up there, whereas if you look down here, there was no cat, but there was a spin at the lower path. So it's a beautiful experiment. And there's the... Um, that's what us theorists do for fun, you know? If we, we just... We, uh, we jiggle the, the, the uranium rods, and it gives you Cherenkov radiation, so... If you're ever in a nuclear reactor, don't know what to do, you can do that. I think it's safe. Maybe not. I'm not sure. But um, I'll also, how much more time do I have, Jan? Three minutes. Huh. So we're going to zip through this. This is a beautiful paper. Um, I'm just going to point it out to you by Yakir, Ellie Cohen, and Sandra Popescu. It um, kind of uh, unites um, the Cheshire Cat with um, another aspect, which I'm going to just briefly touch on. The upshot of all this, which you can read very quickly here, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank Ellie Cohen for these, these slides. The upshot is that there's a kind of way of thinking about a very surprising emergence of the entanglement, not via the usual path by which we create entanglement. It's, it's very surprising. Um, OK, so we did that. Um, we can also say a lot of profound things about contextuality. Um, and I don't have time to go through it. There's been a lot of work done on this by Matt Pusey and Matt Leifer, who's in the audience somewhere. Um, beautiful work that they've done going back 10 years now. Um, and also, uh, so this is uh, Matt's uh, Fizrev letters and other papers on uh, the importance of 
of contextuality as the magic sauce for doing quantum information tasks. Oh, um, yeah, and I want to point out uh, this paper. Kai Wedgel is here, a uh, big guy over here. Um, uh, we've been working on all kinds of other implications of contextuality and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, another aspect of emergence is, is this thing called the quantum uh, uh, pigeonhole principle. And uh, this is uh, a kind of effect which is dual or, or complementary to the usual kind of EPR. So we'll skip through that really quickly because I just want to get to one slide. And here's some main points of uh, one of the papers that, that Kai and I have been working on. Um, the upshot of this is, is a, it's a new way of locally measuring, locally concentrating contextuality in all different situations, all rich, many rich different ways of, of uh, whenever you have a contextuality, you can, you can measure it now weekly and, and see a, a signature of it. So the last thing I just want to point out really quickly is um, uh, the other, you remember in the first slide I mentioned um, another kind of non-locality. This is the Aron of Bohm effect and the fact that there's a non-locality associated with equations of motion. So normally we're taught that um, in, in classical physics, uh, if you want to have a force in something, you have to um, have a, a non-zero gradient in the potential, and that's just a, a feature of the Poisson bracket of classical physics. But it turns out that quantum mechanics, a profound difference is that quantum mechanics, you have to look at the commutators, not the Poisson brackets, and it turns out that the equations of motion are profoundly non-local. So this d, this distance, could be anything, right? You see that the, in the Heisenberg equation of motion, this uh, operator here, which is just a translation operator, obeys this non-local equation of motion. Mm. And uh, um, so we use this to try to analyze the, um, the double slit experiment. I'll just get to the, you can't see any of that, but here's a, a setup for the double slit. We suggest an experiment. Um, it's very beautiful that you can prove that even though uh, there's non-local equations of motion, again, there's no way of violating causality with this. In fact, the only way to actually see this new kind of non-local equations of motion is by merging these two pictures together, by looking at a pre- and post-selected situation and then trying to measure this thing, the modular variable in particular is what it is, trying to measure it, and, and you can do it, and people have actually done this experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so. This kind of picture suggests that we can talk about localized particles, but they have non-local interactions. For example, with, with other slits, if you're looking at a double slit situation. OK, um, actually, I think I made it. So the, the moral of this story, if your only tool is, a ham tool is a hammer, you tend to treat everything as if it were a nail. And the moral is to grasp things, uh, the world more gently by grasping it uh, uh, well, gently. Also, we got a new journal out here. I uh, encourage you to submit things. It's submit your papers to this journal. It's just going gangbusters. Um, and uh, we have a new institute, and that's our website. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.